All right, then, guys. Today's Friday. All right. So um, let's go through some news as always. So right now, I'm looking at the market. The futures look very, very good at the moment. Okay, the futures are doing well, and of course, when we actually see good futures, it usually comes with some good news. So let's look at some of the good news. So let's call some news today. All right. So first up, we have to look at this. China's central bank makes unexpected rate cut as growth crumbles. All right, so from this headline alone, I can think of two things that we want to look into. The first thing will be that China cutting rates, aka all the other markets are going to be doing well, including Chinese markets as well. The reason is simple. It's the same as the US markets. If you know the Federal Reserve do not increase the rates, everyone's going to rally at a good market. People are thinking that you know interest rates are going to be low. That's why, uh, you know, it would make sense for people to continue to invest, continue to borrow money to invest, and so on and so forth. But the second thing that I think that a lot of people need to really understand uh, the huge macro situation below what's actually behind this rate cut is that China might very well be in a recession already. So we have to actually look into the reason why a rate cut happens, okay? Historically, in the US, in China, in Europe, in the UK, all of those countries, it's the same thing, okay? When a rate cut happens, it simply means that a recession happens or it simply means that a bear market happened and the Feds want to save the, the market, hence they are cutting the rate. And if a China central bank makes an unexpected rate cuts as a growth crumbles, I would like to imagine that the Federal Reserve from uh, China from China probably think that you know the growth of the country is getting a huge fatal attack, and the only way for us to actually save the economy is by cutting rates. So, aka recessionary fears. That's my main concern. And since it's, it, since it's finally attacking China, as we have already feared for quite some time to begin with, this is starting to make even more sense in the market. So of course, today, most likely we're going to be seeing a lot of things soar. Okay, you're going to see your SPY go up. You're going to see your QQQ go up. You're going to see your uh, DIA go up. Your Dow Jones, your indexes, all of them are all going to be going up. Okay, that's great. That's great and all, okay? Don't get me wrong. I love that the indexes are going up. But you have to understand something that is very, very critical, okay? Which is underneath all of this, recessionary fears is still there. We have not gotten rid of all the recessionary fears. And because of that, I cannot really put my mind into thinking that, you know, we're all in the clear. Let's just go all the way, okay? Of course, I'm not saying as if, like, I am actually, like, 100% into cash or anything. Um, if anything, I'm actually like 90% in the market as it is. I'm actually trying to get out of market a little bit while the market is prop prompting up and up. Okay, so if today, somehow, you know, I don't know, if somehow today we actually get somewhat of a good market, there is a possibility that I might sell some of my shares. I'm just going to tell you guys right now, uh, for my weekly trades, honestly speaking, nothing fantastic. I actually already went through my weekly trades yesterday. But uh, for my weekly trades, you know, uh, I'm going to tell you, chances are today I might be selling some of my stocks simply because I feel that um, we have a lot more bearish connotation coming up, a lot more bearish capitalists coming up as compared to bullish capitalists. And I do not think that, you know, getting a rate cut on China's central bank is considerably a bullish connotation. If anything, it's going to be a short-term gain and a long-term loss because recession. All right, so let's let's dissect this uh, entire article a little bit more. Okay, central bank cut a key interest rate while keeping another unchanged. Uh, the unexpected policy shift that economists said would likely help the country's uh, more bound housing market, but bring only limited relief to its struggling economy. Okay, um, so of course uh, this is most likely going to be helping only the housing market, especially after what happened with Evergrande. Okay, so. Constrained by rising interest rates in the U.S. and basing zero-tolerance approach to the pandemic, uh, easing too aggressively would risk prompting um, capital to flee China in search of better returns. And I think that that's going to be one of the biggest concerns that we actually have. Okay? 
if they were to just do a huge easing, uh, quantitative easing, uh, completely, it simply means that all the money they are all just going to get out of China, go going into the U.S. market, going to the U.S. real estate, going to Europe, going to even the other Southeast Asian countries as well. So. I do think that you know they probably wouldn't be easing too aggressively, which is why they are only uh, cutting down rates for um, the housing side of things. So that's still all right for now. All right, the uncertainty over China's trajectory this year has further clouded the prospect for global global uh, global growth, which were already darkening as advanced economics um, economies struggle with easing inflation and rising interest rates. Uh, economy blah blah blah. The card was unexpected given that earlier this week, central bank has left unchanged another key policy rate charged on loans from medium-term lending facilities that funnel cash to commercial banks. <clears throat> uh, let's see, Wuhan, okay, we shouldn't expect large-scale stimulus of the kind that we saw in 2020, of course. Um, let's see, uh... Yeah, I, I, I do think that they are basically... Okay, yeah, they're just talking about the history of uh, the interest rates in China. Uh, I do think that, you know, there is a good chance that um, this is not going to be lasting for a very, very long time. I do think that this is just trying to actually boost the housing market a little bit in China. Uh, of course, I'm very, very uh, excited to see what's going to be happen, uh, what's going to happen to the Chinese market after this sudden rate cut. Uh, I'm sure that the Chinese market is also uh, going up on this news as well. Uh, but, you know, something's for sure is that the U.S. market is completely raving over how good this is. Um, and like I said before, you know, I'm 90% in the market. I'm not complaining. I'm very, very happy to see that that's the, that's the case. Uh, but like I said before, short term, very, very good thing. Long term, it simply means that we're all going into a recession. You do have to also take into consideration that China is one of the top five countries that's doing well in the economy in the world okay and if china is going through something like this do you really really think that a lot of countries are going to be safe i don't think so so yeah all right let's move on to the next one which is recession trade is on as market pain spreads beyond tech uh so yeah okay and this is talking about the consumer staples company which is your target well, Target is consumer discretionary. Uh, consumer staples is more like a Walmart, your Costco, your Dollar Tree, uh, and so on. Okay, and they are basically talking about how all of them basically miss on earnings, especially looking at Target, looking at Costco, looking at Walmart. These three companies lose, missing on estimate, missing missing on their earnings estimates is just humongous. And of course, they actually said that it's due to rising inflation, rising wages, rising operational costs. Everything is rising, but the prices are not rising, and the amount of people, uh, the amount that people are buying at every single trip is not going up. If anything, it is going down. So, um, you know, when usually in this sort of market, uh, we expect your tech companies, your growth companies, whatever, all, all this uh, so, so called risk on assets usually are the ones that actually get destroyed um, during any sort of a market volatility. volatility uh, cycle when you look at the um, VIX go all the way up, you can clearly know for a fact. Okay, look at your Twitter, look at your Snapchat, look at your SoFi, look at your Palantir, look at your Tesla. All of them, pummel. Okay, growth destroyed, tech destroyed, risk on destroyed, crypto destroyed, like financial, like fin fintech destroyed. All of this are all getting destroyed. However, usually during high volatility period. What actually remains solid are your companies, such as your Walmart, your Costco, your Target, okay? And of course, alongside your at and your Verizon, okay? And alongside your Coca-Cola, your McDonald's, your Wendy's and such. Cool, 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 okay? Fair. Okay, but right now, this recession trade is now spreading pain all the way beyond tech, Okay, tech is not the only industry that's getting all the pain now. If you see Target getting 25% intraday loss, just poof, gone, then you know for a fact that, you know, this is starting to affect more than just tech. Okay, even risk off assets are getting affected now. And that's going to be one of the possible tricks of how recession trade is going to be starting to happen as well. All right, moving on. 
Fresh monkeypox cases uh, appear in US, Europe, and Australia. And for people who don't know what monkeypox is, uh, this is actually something new that uh, came up in, in the US. Um, and monkeypox is basically a cousin to smallpox. And for people who remember what happened uh, with smallpox um, earlier in the uh, earlier in the century, uh, you, you most likely would know that you know that it was one of the most deadliest um, virus that actually happened and finding the cure to it was easily one of the greatest achievements of mankind. I'm almost certain that the person who found it like got some Nobel Peace Award or something along that line. Uh, and right now with monkeypox coming out, um, of course, right now they're saying that, you know, monkeypox is not as deadly. Uh, it only kills 1% of the infected. Uh, although not as deadly, but still very, very dangerous, nevertheless. 1% is still a huge number, nevertheless. Right. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're saying that the infection rate for monkeypox is also slightly lower than smallpox. So hopefully all is fine. Right now, scientists are trying to find the correlation between monkeypox and how they actually got to the uh, main, the other side of the globe, because usually monkeypox um, is feral mostly in the African countries. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm not sure uh, why this fresh monkeypox cases are appearing in US, Europe, and also Australia. Okay, so you can see that you know they're hunting for the links uh, between the scattered infections uh, that has been emerging in the northern hemisphere for about two weeks now. Okay, um, yeah, okay, like over here, the Iran, the eradication of a smallpox was one of the greatest achievements in human health and public health history. Uh, but it left the world without immunity to pox viruses. It's not surprising to see more cases occur when people are exposed. Uh, of course, you know, significantly less dangerous than smallpox uh, and believed to kill about 1% of those infected. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to be something that we need to be really, really worried about, like what happened with the uh, coronavirus. Uh, I'm not sure if COVID-19 had this kind of start as well. If we continue to see such news happening, and when I say we continue to see this kind of news, it means that like, you know, in the next few weeks, we start to see 10 people get it, 30 people get it, 50 people get it, then I'm not going to lie, this might call for concern in the market all over again. So yeah. All right, anyway, let's move on to the next news. <laughs> okay. Uh... <laughs> Well, I, I didn't actually plan this, but uh, Bored Ape after monkeypox. Okay, Bored Ape NFT barred from sale by Singapore Court after dispute. Uh, okay, for people who do not know about this news um, in Singapore, basically, uh, there was this guy who uh, owned uh, a Bored Ape and owned multiple other NFTs, and he used NFT5, okay, which is basically a financing platform that uses NFT as collateral for you to actually borrow more money. And due to the whole huge fluctuation of how NFT prices went, uh, he basically got margin called to a certain extent. And when he got margin called, um, you know, he basically had to sell his uh, board aid. And because of that, uh, right now this board aid NFT, due to the fact that it's non-fungible, it's very hard for them to actually just sell it. Uh, because, of course, you would also need to find a willing buyer. Uh, so, of course, I think that this, this news is kind of interesting to a certain extent. It's the first decision in a commercial dispute where NFTs are recognized as valuable property worth protecting. Uh, so, more than merely strings of numbers and codes imprinted on the blockchain, the implication is that NFT is a digital asset and people who invest in it have the right that can be protected. Okay? So, one of the claimant's most treasured possession it is irreplaceable to him. Uh, no intention to ever part with or sell it. Um, and yeah, due to its rarity and its high value, he can get larger loans um, according to the filing. Uh, and this kind of just brought off the whole NFT file uh, things where, you know, people can actually borrow more money uh, with the amount of NFTs that they do have. And of course, that's going to bring forth another question, which is, is NFT really considered as a proper IP? Okay, is it actually worth um, using as a valuable asset as collateral for actual money for fiat currency? You know, there's going to be a lot of uh, ch uh, chatter around it. I know that, you know, a lot of people probably would say that, you know, um, body apes and crypto punks should definitely have that sort of uh, leverage for collateral. Uh, but honestly, at the same time, and the, you know, the side of NFT is, is so wild to the point where 
you know, it's almost to the point where you can actually say that, for example, if I were to borrow money based on the amount of Luna I have, for example, okay, I don't think that that's a very, very far stretch. Okay, if, let, for example, before the Luna crashed to less than a hundredth of a cent, okay, if I were to own, a, say, 5,000 Lunas back then, you know, could, could I actually put up 5,000 Lunas uh, at $120 per Luna uh, as a collateral for, let's say, a, a $20,000 loan? Okay, chances are I probably could, okay, because if, you know, NFT Fi allows it, chances are Block Fi allows it as well. Okay, and if I were to do something of that sort, and when Luna ultimately just dropped a lot in price, the moment Luna dropped to about $30 or so, I would have already received a call saying that, you know, oops, you know, your Luna just dropped in price, you have to return the money ASAP and things like that. Uh, but, you know, if it actually fall way faster than we actually expected to drop, okay, like for example, if it actually dropped all the way to a tenth of a cent, um, in literally 24 hours, then that call might not even happen and I will not be able to return the money in time either. And I think that, you know, that's the whole point of collateral uh, with assets that are not exactly being regulated, aka your cryptocurrency and also NFTs. Of course, this is going to be a huge uh, topic for us to really talk into. Uh, and like I said before yesterday, in yesterday's news, I do have a video coming up tomorrow uh, where I'll talk more about this uh, in more details if you guys are actually interested in the crypto, NFT, Luna, whatever thing that's actually going on in that sphere. All right, anyway, next up, uh, we have uh, Dow Futures rebounding by more than 200 points. Uh, Friday as it hits for an eight negative week in a row. Honestly, reading such a headline should kind of scare you uh, to a certain extent because it does definitely scared me a little bit. You know, when you see that, you know, rebounding by more than 200 points. Sounds fantastic. As it hits for the eighth negative week in a row. Do you have any idea how bad it, it is for an index fund? On the, well, not even fund, an index, straight up an index dropping for eight weeks in a row. Um, you know, for the for the SPY, for example, um, the SPY, which is uh, basically a fund that mimics the S&P 500, uh, the SPY has always been above $430. Right now, it dropped all the way to $389 yesterday. Right now, after the whole futures actually basically exploded a little bit, it's currently floating above $394, which isn't even that high, okay? Uh, which is why, you know, if you look over here, Dow Futures rebounding, you so it sounds great. It sounds fantastic, you know, but it has for its eighth negative week in a row. In a row. Like, you, you can kind of imagine, like, the amount. You can just kind of imagine the amount of fear uh, in the market, the amount of panic that's happening in the market as well. So i do think that you know this is definitely going to be something that we have to really look into as well uh of course right now you can see that you know all of them are talking about it which is futures that may have gotten a boost from china overnight cut a key benchmark rate for mortgages uh as COVID shutdown hit the economy uh so yeah of course we kind of expected uh the, the futures to be up uh, from that news as well all right next up we have a mask denying while accusation against him in in parent Reference to harassment report. SpaceX founder and CEO Elon Musk in a tweet late Thursday said uh, are not true. He explained what those accusations were. The aerospace company paid $250,000 in severance to a flight attendant to settle an allegation that Musk engaged in a sexual misconduct against her. Uh, Musk told Insider there was a lot more to this story as he asked the publication for more time to respond to the article claim according to the outlet. Um Hey man, I don't know. Like, uh, utterly untrue. I mean, all right. So, uh, let's see. The report cited interviews, documents obtained by Insider. Uh, for the record, okay, the attacks against me should be viewed through a political lens. This is their standard despicable playbook. Uh, okay, honestly speaking, I'm not sure what to really believe in right now. I, I, I do not want to be that justice warrior that just stand up um, for Elon Musk and say that, you know, Elon Musk is definitely correct. Elon Musk is not never going to, um, you know, do any such, uh, sort of sexual misconduct on any of his employees. Um, 
I don't think that, that that's the right thing to do either. But at the same time, uh, I just find it very, very coincidental that, you know, uh, this happened right after Elon Musk said that, you know, he is going to be voting Republican. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be a bad play from the Democrat side of, uh, for side of view. Or it could just be that Elon Musk basically knew that this is going to be coming out soon. And he just said that, you know, I'm going to vote vote for Republican and, you know, this happened. So he can easily say that, you know, yeah, you know, it is basically some political play on, on this sort of thing. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how this is actually going to go. So, uh, all right. Uh, CNBC reached out to Musk, uh, SpaceX for comment. Um, yeah, okay. If I were to incline to engage in sexual harassment, this is unlikely to be the first time in my entire 30 year career that's come to light. Uh, Musk reportedly wrote Insider, he said that its article was a politically motivated hit piece. Uh, yeah, honestly speaking, uh, I do think that th that is true as well. You know, if Elon Musk wanted to do any sort of sexual uh, sexual misconduct or any sort of sexual harassment against any of his employees, uh, I do think that he would easily be able to do so um, in the first 10 years or even first 20 years. Uh, and I don't think that he needs to be so reached the point where he's able to do so without getting any sort of repercussion. Uh, because let's be honest, after he, his sale of... PayPal, he basically has so much money that he can basically do all that he wants. And the moment he actually started Tesla, he can already do all that he wants. Okay, he don't have to wait 30 years for him to actually start it. Uh, so I would be more inclined to believe that it's more like a political motivated hit piece according to Elon Musk as well. All right, anyway, let's move on to the next one. Uh, Finland. Man, this is hot. Okay, yeah, Russia will shut off a gas to Finland from Saturday, fin Finnish energy provider said. Uh, so, of course, this is in regards to Finland and uh, Sweden signing into NATO. They have finally successfully uh, joined NATO. And because of that, Russia said that, you know, you know what, since you guys are going to NATO, you guys are not getting cheap gas. You guys are not getting cheap fuel. You guys are not getting cheap oil. Okay. Fair play, fair play, you know, uh, and I do think that uh, from Finland's point of view, I do think that they are, they were actually uh, going through a huge dilemma as well, okay? They had two choices, either possibly, you know, getting into war with Russia in the future over something stupid, or they have to, um, you know, choose to get rid of uh, the dependence on Russia's oil. And clearly, Finland chose the other one uh, and joined NATO because this way, uh, the chances of uh, Russia actually attacking uh, Finland now is close to zero. Okay, it's as close to zero as they can be because I'm pretty sure Russia do not want to uh, suddenly attack any of the NATO countries as well. So, yeah, uh, I do think that this is uh, something that was very, very well expected the moment that we received news that, that Finland and Sweden joined NATO. So not, not, not much of a surprise there. All right, and lastly, uh, Chinese electric car startup Neo says supply chain disruption and not demand is its biggest uh, problem. Uh, I do think that in the whole entire EV sphere of things, uh, I do think that a lot of time uh, um, companies like to say that it's not demand, it's usually, usually the supply chain disruptions as well. I am usually um, a big believer that um, demand is uh, usually the bigger problem, uh, not the supply chain disruption, uh, other than for some of the better companies. So, for example, if Tesla were to say that, I'll believe them. Okay. And I'm not saying that because it's just Tesla. Okay. For example, in Chinese side things, if you're saying that BYD, BYD comes out and tell me that, you know, demand is not an issue, supply chain is the issue, I'll totally believe them as well. Okay. However, if you're telling me that, you know, if Rivian, or if a Lucid Motors come up and tell me that, you know, oh, you know, demand is not our issue, you know, supply chain disruption is our issue. I'm not going to believe you. I'm sorry, okay? When you do not sell enough cars for me to care, you cannot say that demand is not your issue, okay? And it's true that, you know, you can just mass produce as much vehicles as you can and then just keep them in an inventory and then hopefully one day you can sell them all, okay? That's not going to be a viable tactic. Okay, however, for Tesla and for BYD, I can totally understand where they're coming from. Especially if you go through the earnings report for Tesla, you can see that their inventory are getting lesser and lesser. And the, the fact that they are, can, they are unable to produce uh, their Model 3s and Model Ys as fast as they could before, it was simply via supply chain disruption. 
And I think that those are considerably believable um, reasons of why uh, supply chain disruption would be a huge issue and not demand, okay? But as for Neo, I do think that it's slightly difficult for me to really uh, put my finger on it because for Neo and XPeng, I do understand that they're both under uh, BYD. Um, by no means are they over BYD in any any case, state or form, uh, which is why I'm not really uh, that inclined to believe that you know Neo actually uh, don't have a demand issue, okay? Uh, but you know, ultimately, I do I do think that um, Neo not only do they have a demand issue, they also have a supply chain disruption issue. So I would be more inclined to believe that you know if a supply chain uh, disruption issues got completely solved, Neo would not be completely out in the open either. I don't think that Neo is going to be suddenly just be like, oh, you know what? We're going to sell our cars like hotcakes. I don't believe that's going to be the case. Uh, I do think that demand is still going to be a problem uh, for Neo to a certain extent as well. All right, my name, that's all I have for today's news. Um, surprisingly long news. Uh, I was expecting to do it below 20 minutes. But anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you guys um, tomorrow for Saturday's video. And also, I'll see you guys on Monday. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys. Bye.